Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing in Edward Square in Kensington, W8. Four roads north of the killing of Churchill super spy Christina Scarbeck. A short walk east of the former school of the victim of the beast, Katerina Konyeva. A few streets west of the basement where the entire McSwan family were dissolved in acid. And a few doors down from the killer who couldn't say goodbye. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Hidden away off Kensington High Street, Edwards Square is a posh little place. A manicured private garden surrounded by townhouses mostly owned by stiff, starchy, chin-stroking twits who dawdle and drone through galleries about a piece's exquisite composition, not realising they're staring at a bin. Given its long history as the home of the well-to-do, many buildings have blue plaques, organised by a committee of old grey men. These plaques often celebrate a tenuous link to someone long dead and forgotten, half of whom make the bemused passers-by think and then state, No, never heard of them. Of Edward Square lies Pembroke Court, a six-storey Art Deco apartment block built in the 1920s. Back in 1962, the basement flat at 17 Pembroke Court was owned by George Brynham, a respected trade unionist and chairman of the Labour Party, who was hailed as a prime minister in the making. And yet there was no blue plaque to George Brynham. Some may say this was down to his political affiliations. Others might imply it was owing to his love life. But maybe... It's simply down to a scandal, which on Saturday the 17th of November 1962, led to his murder. But why was George Brynham killed? And did a quirk of the law let his murderer go free? My name is Michael, I'm your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 194 the Gay Panic. On the 4th of July 1967, the Sexual Offences Act passed in the House of Commons. A bill purported to decriminalise homosexuality and to equalise a person's legal status, regardless of their sexual orientation. As a gay man, George would die five years before this decriminalisation, and in an era when it was still acceptable to use homophobia as a legal defence. It was referred to as the Gay Panic. George Ivor Brynham was born on the 31st of January 1917 in Brixham, Devon. Raised by Elijah a fisherman and Annie a housewife, George was one of three siblings raised in a loving family. From his hard-working parents, George learned the value of loyalty and love. But also how even a little lad from the back end of nowhere could and should stand up for the rights of the average person. As a high achiever who came from little, George made the most of every opportunity. In 1932, age 15, he became an apprentice joiner, a blue beer and merchant in Brixham. Staying for five years, becoming the shop steward, 
and already being politically active, the senior union rep. Being well-dressed and softly spoken, he impressed his seniors. But regarded by some as a scrapper and by others as a troublemaker, George was young, smart and hungry. Age 19, he became honorary secretary of the Torquay Labour Party. He formed the first local committees of the shipbuilding and engineering unions. He was trade union rep of the Admiralty Shipyard Control Advisory Committee, all in his early and mid-twenties. And in 1944, he was appointed Justice of the Peace, the youngest at that time, and elected to Brixham Urban Council where he served as a councillor for three years. In his spare time, he studied economics and local government affairs, eventually becoming a tutor and a fellow of the Royal Economic Society. In 1952, he was elected to the National Labour Party Executive, becoming its youngest member. In 1955, having joined the Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers, he became its youngest ever chairman and later its president. And by 1959, aged just 42, George Brynham, a young shy lad from a small fishing town, had become the youngest chairman of the Labour Party. The stratospheric career of George Brynham was public and well documented. And yet his private life was not. On paper, George did not have a criminal record for acts which in the 1950s and 60s were illegal. According to declassified police records, in 1956, a naval rating claimed he was picked up in Hyde Park and at the Tregaren Hotel in Bayswater, George paid him 10 shillings to engage in masturbation. George was questioned, he denied any indecency and he was released with no charges. In 1958, an unnamed guardsman alleged that George had attempted to commit buggery upon him at his flat at 17 Pembroke Court. But with no corroborative evidence, and George denying it took place, no charges were made. And in December 1961, an unnamed youth, who had claimed he was paid £5 on several occasions for sex, was arrested having broken into the flat. George denied knowing him, and the case was closed. With high-ranking friends in most government departments, it's likely that these scandals were silenced for fear of ruining his career and the reputation of the party. But being so well insulated, this protection is likely to have led to George being a lot less cautious about his illegal sexual activities. In May 1958, George moved into 17 Pembroke Court in Edwards Square, W8. Although he lived there for four years, few of the neighbours knew this shy, quiet man but they all knew he was gay. Witnessing his homosexual shenanigans, Mrs. Christina Ansel of Flat 14 gave an account to the police. He'd not been living there long before I noticed that he was having a number of young men call upon him at the flat. I remember a Saturday afternoon about 18 months ago I heard a young man's voice shout, You're hurting me. 
It sounded as if the young man was distressed. Then immediately afterwards, I heard a struggle. Informing Mrs. Lucy Alcock, the caretaker, this suspected assault was reported to the landlords. But as Mr. Brinham was a good tenant, they simply asked him to be quieter from that point on. Whatever went on in his private little flat, whether rough sex or sadomasochism, it didn't dampen his ardour for lusting after young men. He just made it a little less obvious for the sticky beaks who blabbed to the police. With the windows shut and the curtains closed, Christina would state, When I saw him bringing in young men, shortly after entering the flat, I would hear music being played very loudly. Lucy recalled, I heard screaming coming from the flat. And as the screams got louder, the volume of the music was turned up. It was always the same music, which would last about 15 minutes. Then it would all go quiet again. I would see him and a young man go out and get into a car and drive away. It was obvious to me that this man was a homosexual. But we just had to put up with it. And yet the lackluster way in which George conducted his secret sex life also made him an easy target. In October 1962, 11 months after an unnamed rent boy was released having broken into George's flat. Either a different boy or the same boy had committed a burglary, stealing items from his home. A neighbour saw George repairing a broken window at the rear basement bedroom. And when he asked him if he'd informed the police, George replied, No, it's no good. They won't do anything. In 1962, with homosexuality illegal, and gays regarded as little more than sadistic sexual deviants, who corrupted decent society with their ungodly ways, George knew that he was an easy target. He had money, he was slightly built, and having a flat filled with erotic art and gay porn, he was easy to blackmail. And as the punishment for homosexuality was more severe than it was for burglary, he knew his sexuality would most likely be used against him, and any public exposure would risk ruining his career. Barely three weeks later, having been murdered in his own flat, the culprit's defence would be the gay panic. Also known as homosexual panic disorder, psychiatrist Edward J. Kempf coined the term in 1920 to define a panic due to the pressure of uncontrollable perverse sexual cravings. Accepted in British courts as a legal strategy, a defendant could claim that he'd been provoked into committing an act of violence in self-defence because of unwanted sexual advances of a person of the same sex. But was this solely a strategy used to defend the murderer of George Brynham? Or was George chosen as a victim of crime because the law made him an easy target? Saturday the 17th of November 1962 was George's last day alive. He wouldn't know that, and neither would his murderer, as both men seemingly went about their ordinary lives. At roughly half past two, 
George met a young man called Lawrence Summers outside of a gunsmith's near the Strand by Covent Garden. Lawrence would state, This fellow just started talking to me. I didn't know who he was. He offered me a cigarette. George was a 45-year-old trade unionist. Lawrence was a 16-year-old boy from a broken home. We went into a few cafes. Then he asked me back to his flat for a drink, and we both had a couple of bottles of brown ale each. According to Lawrence, both men were strangers, and he was not gay. We then went to the pictures. Tarzan and Aladdin was on. It would be getting on for about 10 o'clock at night, and we went back to his flat for a drink. Having heard George's Blue Ford console pull up on Edward Square, the neighbours at Pembroke Court paid no attention, as this middle-aged man led a scruffy young boy into his basement flat. As a predatory male with a penchant for young boys, George wanted Lawrence. But why was Lawrence there? Lawrence Thomas Summers was born in Ireland on the 28th of June 1946. As the eldest of five to a battered mother and an abusive father described as an aggressive psychopath, his childhood was short and cruel. Being quick-tempered and emotionally cold, he lacked trust in others and struggled to cope. In 1957, Five years prior to George's murder, his parents had separated, his mother had sued his father on the grounds of cruelty, and they had moved into a council house on the Hurst Farm estate in Matlock. Affected by the family split, he began a spate of minor crimes. On the 2nd of January 1958, aged 11, he was discharged from Matlock Juvenile Court for stealing chocolate. On the 27th of January 1960, aged 13, he was given two years probation for stealing a motorbike in Derby. And on the 23rd of February 1961, aged 14, he received a further two years probation for the theft of a national assistance book and seven pounds in cash. Lawrence was little more than a lost youth, lacking love and a male role model. A few months prior, he had moved into a lodging at 41 Winchester Street in Victoria, which he shared with his psychopathic father. He worked irregular hours as a pub cellarman, and he had a rocky relationship with his current girlfriend. And now, for reasons unknown to anyone but him, he was in the flat of a predatory homosexual. But why? At 10pm, with the windows shut, the doors locked and the curtains closed, George began to entertain his young guest as Lawrence removed his coat and his gloves. This chap told me his name was George. We had a few more drinks, we talked and played records. As always, with the same tune muffling every sound, the neighbours didn't complain as they knew it wouldn't last for long. George's flat was elegantly decorated with stylish furnishings, and with his sideboard and walls covered in homoerotic art of naked men wrestling, Lawrence must have known that George was gay. 
from a heavy crystal decanter. George poured them both a few fingers of finest brandy. As this man and boy sat chatting in the sitting room, supping boozy drinks as the music enveloped every sound. Lawrence would state, he asked me to stay the night with him. And I said, I wouldn't. Nearby, a stash of gay porn lay in a drawer. With titles like Beau and Sir Gay, they depicted muscle-bound hunks in posing pouches, engaged in passionate, homoerotic postures with other naked men. Lawrence shifted awkwardly on the sofa. The man made improper advances. He put his arms around me and he said, give us a kiss. Coming from a man, I thought that was improper. Dressed in just a white vest and black trousers. At some point, George had loosened his braces as they were later found undone. Unnerved, Lawrence got up and stood across the other side of the room by the sideboard. But George followed him. He kept on at me and he tried to take hold of my privates. Panicked at being sexually assaulted by a male stranger, I got the bottle from the side. It was the heavy glass decanter. I pushed him away. But as George came at him again, I belted him a number of times over the head. Smashed over the head three times with a two kilo decanter. As the glass was intact, his skull fractured, taking the full force. As rivers of blood streamed down his face, into his eyes and onto his white shirt. He ran towards the door in the hall, but as he was trying to unfasten it, he collapsed. I dragged him back into the living room and left him there on his back. Lawrence would state, I hit him to get away. I didn't mean to kill him. With the music still on, the neighbors heard nothing. I stood and thought what I was gonna do. I was in a bit of a panic. I thought I would make it look like a burglary. I opened the drawers and threw everything all over the place. After this, I just ran out and slammed the door behind me. Lawrence had escaped a buggering. But it was only after he had left the flat that he remembered. In his panic to escape, he had left his coat and gloves on George's bed. But by then, it was too late. The next morning, Lawrence stole a van and he fled to his mother's in Matlock. On Thursday the 22nd of November 1962, George was due to attend a meeting of the Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers. But as he didn't arrive, the caretaker of the TUC alerted the fire brigade, and at 3.15pm, his body was found. Initially arrested for the theft of a van stolen in Finchley, just one day after the murder, 16-year-old Lawrence Thomas Summers was questioned, and his fingerprints matched those inside George's flat and on the glass decanter. The trial began at the Old Bailey on the 18th of December 1962, two weeks after George's funeral. Presented before Mr. Justice Paul, 
The timeline and evidence was clear, and neither the defence nor the prosecution would query whether Lawrence had smashed George over the head with a glass decanter. He had, and he had admitted it. The question was one of provocation. Was this a willful murder, or a manslaughter by self-defence, committed whilst being sexually assaulted by a man, and in the grip of a gay panic? Unlike any other trial, the murderer was depicted as a young innocent boy who had fled an ungodly act, with a victim. Now dead and defenceless, described as an old pervert who preyed on the young. With Lawrence as the sole witness to the attack, this could have been the truth, a lie, or an alibi. And yet they did not question Lawrence's history, his sexuality, or his motive. Four witnesses were called. None of whom had seen or heard anything. Christine and Frederick Ansell of Flat 14, and Lucy Olcock of Flat 18, could only testify to the screams and the indecent acts George had committed upon vulnerable young men in the weeks and months prior. With a fourth witness, whose name was redacted, believed to be the unnamed naval rating who George had paid for sex. Disregard it as contradictory evidence of any credence. It wasn't questioned why Lawrence's coat and gloves were on George's bed, or why the blood spatter wasn't predominantly found by the sideboard, where he was allegedly hit, but in the hall, by the door. This was taken as the boy's confusion, caused by panic. If provocation could be proven, then the judge decreed that murder had to be ruled out. Presented before the judge were four key pieces of evidence: the glass decanter, the coat, the gloves, and two statements by Lovin Summers. But the other exhibits, accepted into evidence. Were there to prove that the murder victim was a predatory homosexual. Many of the crime scene photos focused not on the body or the blood, but on the homoerotic art and gay porn, which was listed in a court of law as a male pervert's literature. These magazines were called into evidence. But it could not be proven if they were used that night. In Lawrence's defence, Edward Clark QC would state, "There is still a plea of not guilty to manslaughter, because there is a defence that you are entitled to kill a man if he is committing an atrocious crime against you, suggesting that murder is acceptable." If you deem a gay man's advances as a threat, and yet the worst evidence was presented by respected pathologist Dr. Donald Tear. In his autopsy report, he would state his genitals were rather small, which served no purpose but to humiliate. His anus admitted three fingers. Proving that George had been engaged in the illegal act of buggery, and most bafflingly of all, for a man of science, he stated that it wasn't the decanter's toughness which had fractured George's skull, but that death was due to a thinning skull, and in my opinion, the condition was consistent with long-practiced homosexuality or self-inflicted perversion. There was no medical examination of Lawrence, either to prove if he had defensive wounds, 
or had engaged in anal sex. On the 21st of January 1963, Mr Justice Paul directed the jury to ignore the charge of murder and said, I cannot see how any jury properly directed on the evidence can fail to see that there was provocation. There is this statement of the lad which shows quite clearly that this man attempted to make homosexual advances and that in consequence Lawrence Summers picked up the decanter and hit him on the head. I should think that is about as clear a case of provocation as it is possible to have. Found not guilty of manslaughter, the judge ordered Lawrence Summers to be discharged and said to his mother, if possible, find him work in Matlock and take him home. There are dangers in London. Declared an innocent man, he left the Old Bailey and as far as we know, he never returned to London. Given the evidence, it's easy to accept the facts that George's death occurred the way it has been presented, as it's likely that it was. But with so much focus on George's indecent sexual appetite, there were a wealth of questions which were never answered. Most importantly, why did a young, heterosexual boy agree to visit the secluded flat of a middle-aged homosexual stranger? Was he innocent of sex, of danger, and of gay men? Or was his young age a convenient excuse? And if the gay panic was used as a useful alibi, knowing that George would never go to the police, even if he was attacked or burgled, did this failure of the law make him an easy target for a young thief? Let's hope that recorded. Did it record? I think so. I think it did. There we go. There's your little hood off. So you can enjoy all the sounds of coots outside. Oh, coots outside. Uh, and not uh, lawnmower wanker. Lawnmower wanker's not there today. I almost thought he was. I almost thought he was. I heard a, I heard a sound. I was like, oh, you, f you fornicator. But no, it wasn't him, thank God. It's been relatively okay. Helicopter wankers going past, as always. People in their little two-seater uh, aircraft. Me, oh, I'm flying off to me meeting. Oh, twats. Uh, apart from that, all right. I think I'm, go I'm gonna make me a little cup of tea, he thinks. Open some curtains. Uh, make me a cup of tea. Eva, do you want a cup of tea? Mm -hmm. uh. I don't know if that's a yes or a no. Best make one just in case, otherwise she'll get angry. You know what she's like. She gets she gets angry all the time, especially when she's hungover. Although she's worse when she's sober. Although she's not often sober. That's the worst thing, isn't it? When she's getting when she's sobering up, that's when the hangovers kick in, which is why she's always pissed. Anyway, oh stuff and life, stuff and life. Uh, so kettles on. Uh, with my Murder Mile mug Ooh, and, and a Yorkshire biscuit tea. Uh, what else is going on? I'm going to nip up to uh, the little little cafe in a bit. It's nice. They know me there now. I don't need to order. Just walk in, have me hot chocolate. It's Tuesday, so I can have me Belgian bun. As long as there's enough left, that'll be nice. Just powering through stuff at the moment, keeping busy. I want to make sure I've got... Uh, I thought to myself ages ago, I thought, let's let's... Uh, let's do as much work as we can. Let's really power through this. So, um, as of recording, this is the 16th of November. Uh, this episode, I think it goes out 7th of December or something. I'm way ahead. I'm powering through. I'm just, I'm just not taking breaks anymore. I'm just powering through, 
be, be, being more efficient and therefore december comes that means i can have a break but also i can get into the archives and get stuff done it'll be nice and quiet in december so i'm looking forward to that what else is going on yeah oh yeah don't forget uh, so murder mile uh, will finish uh, we, uh the last episode's finish i think it's 23rd i might do a, a christmas special that might go out then we're off for january uh, i'm in the archives i've got to do some repairs on the boat so uh a new series starts february so don't forget that every year someone always gets in touch and goes murder miles finished it's quit it's quit look there's no more episodes it's quit he's not doing them anymore i'm almost certain of it the amount of times people have come up to me and said you know you have quit and i'll go no i haven't looked there's new episodes coming out no you definitely said that you quit <laughs> oh so yeah there's uh two yeah as always as happens every year i'm off january don't forget put put it in your diary off january there we go uh thank you to some uh new patreon supporters right so thank you to holly denby thank you holly uh sandra haig thank you sandra and michael fanning thank you michael so uh holly sandra and michael thank you so much for becoming patreon supporters that's very much appreciated you'll be getting all the all the exciting goodies uh depending on what tier you want you, you everyone gets uh exclusive photos for with this you'll get crime scene photos a uh, nice little video that goes with it you get uh and the recording script that goes with it that, that it's the unedited version so you get all the extra stuff that no one else will hear about um depending on what tier you're on you also get walk with me uh which is if you like extra mile it's kind of an extra extra mile and i dive into all the stuff that's hidden in the edit that no one also hear, hear about and also i save a lot of good stuff for that as well so and it's a nice little thing uh you also get the weekly inch which is the daily inch everyone gets that but it depends on what tier which episodes you get just loads of stuff loads of stuff it's all great value all great value and of course you get all the goodies that comes with it all the all the gifts that come through the post ah which is great um there we go just gonna pop that in there let that stew for a bit oh i really need to pee in a second oh right so let's uh let's dive into oh oh also a thank you to uh lorraine dalgleish for your very kind donation uh lorraine donated via the murder mile website there's a little donate button so thank you very much Whew. um i'm gonna do some quiz questions uh we'll do the answers to these very shortly so let's get rocking uh, question number one in what year was the sexual offenses act passed which de which inverted co commas decriminalized homosexuality so in what year was the homo well in what year was the sexual offenses act passed which decriminalized homosexuality question number two what was george's middle name question number three what job did george's dad do Question number four, similar line, what was George's first job? Question number five, what age was George when he became chairman of the Labour Party? Mr. Speaker. There you go, I'll just roll out my little Neil Kinnock impression. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number six, in what park did George meet the unnamed naval rating? Question number seven, gay panic was defined by a psychiatrist by what title? Question number eight, uh, outside of what kind of shop did George and Lawrence meet? Question number nine, uh, what two drinks uh, do we know that they drank? And question number 10, what two films did they see at the cinema? I also, also forgot to say, uh, welcome to Extra Mile. For new people, this is unedited, unscripted bit. What I do is I do some quiz questions, I have a cup of tea. Uh, we dive into some extra stuff about the episode. And there's a little treat for everyone, because for people who can't be asked to listen to this bit, I'm going to tell you something that I really thought about putting in the episode, but then I thought, no, I'm going to save it. So let me go and grab me cup, uh, and then we'll do that. Right, tea's up. Oh, look, and I've got oh yeah not only is teas up but i've got my uh, seafood sticks ready to go oh no i'll have my seafood sticks with me dindins diet there we go i will have seafood sticks kebabs problem solved don't need to go to the shops right okay i was going to put this in as a post 
uh, for, for the final bit, but I thought I'll save it. So, Lawrence Summers, we dived into his past, but we didn't dive into his future. So after I'd researched, the, I've been researching this case. After I was researching this case, actually researching this case, I dived into, uh, I went through the archives to find out more stuff about him, about what happened to him after this. So obviously this was, this trial was December to December 62 to January 63, with the murder taking place in November 1962. So uh, he did go back to Matlock in Derbyshire to go and live with his mum. But 7th of February 1964, uh, 16-year-old uh, Lawrence of Matlock was sent to a detention centre for six months by a Lat Lat Matlock magistrate's court, having threatened his former girlfriend, stating, if I can't go with you, I'll carve you up so no one else will want to. Lovely man. Pleading guilty, uh, he was unemployed at the time. He still lived at home with his mum on the Hearst Farm estate and was, and was sentenced uh, for assaulting her name was Barbara Webster of two Dales uh, for causing her actual bodily harm uh, he served three months uh, for actual bodily harm and for carrying an offensive we weapon so this wasn't an idle threat he did have uh, a weapon on him um, uh, and also served six months for stealing two guine guineas from a gas meter at home so he's stealing from his mum uh, tenth uh, a, a report states she would state um, she wanted to enter the relationship he lost control of himself and uh, behaved in a wild fashion uh, he put his hands around her neck and started to choke her he then produced a kitchen knife and pushed it against her neck uh, although not deeply enough as to wound her uh, the next night as she was waiting outside of a cafe where she worked um, PC Tart that's her name, PC Tart. Could be a man. Could be a man. I'm just making a bit objective. Well, uh, PC Tart. <laughs> what a name, PC Tart. PC Tart searched Summers and found the kitchen knife on him. When arrested, Summers asked for four other charges to be taken into consideration. So he's uh, he's criminal career is increasing by that point. Um, so he served his time in prison, but upon release. 18th of February uh, 1967 so so actually no this is a couple of years later so he was uh, 20 by this point he was in Nottingham he was accused of rape uh, unemployed man of uh, still living at Hearst Farm Estate uh, was alleged to have entered the kitchen of 52 of a 52 year old woman a spinster uh, locked the door behind her and thrown her to the floor Summers admitting having intercourse with the woman but denied it was without consent uh, he was arrested on the 2nd of February, remained in custody and made application for bail. Um, the lady's name was uh, Dorothy Blackburn. He entered her home at Lime Tree Road in Matlock and his application for bail was denied. Uh, we don't know the outcome of that case. I did search, but it, it wasn't reported and we haven't got access to the files. Uh, he was... Oh, he was uh, granted bail by a Derby magistrate... Uh, and was told to keep out of Derby. Uh, Lawrence Thomas Summers, he was uh, 27 of... Uh, there's another one here. Sorry, this is 1974. So, sorry, it's, it's, I haven't looked at this stuff in ages. So, uh, May 1974, um, while he was living in Ripley, uh, he was charged with uh, assaulting a man at Upper Hartshay Farm... Uh, charged with causing grievous bodily harm and intent to cause Mr. Philip Hansey, uh, who had previous convictions for car theft, uh, for assaulting him. He was remanded on bail for four weeks. And we don't know the outcome of that trial. Uh, but he was told, as mentioned at the start, to keep out of Derby. Uh, it obviously didn't do that because uh, Lawrence Summers died in Derby in 1999. So there you go. I didn't put that in the episode uh, because this was all about the gay panic. But so that's what it's focused on. But as people who uh, stay for extra mile, the murky milers who stay to the bitter end. There you go. That's a nice little present for you. Uh, the discovery of the body, um, as mentioned, uh, da, 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 what's his name? George. George was meant to be going uh, to a meeting at the Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers in Clapham. Um, he'd, 
he was meant to come for a 10 o'clock meeting he didn't he was meant to be there for lunch he didn't uh andrew smith who was the caretaker there uh went to his flat uh saw that a light was on rang the bell got no reply looked through the letterbox he said that he saw the body lying on the floor um it's likely that you just saw the feet because the body was actually in the living room um the the uh electric fire was on it had been left on the radio was on but the music wasn't playing because the record had, had finished um they called the police the police called the fire brigade the fire brigade were the ones who broke in uh what else we got let's dive down um let's look at I, I i deliberately in this case skimmed over the um uh the investigation so uh, diving into this the only um medical details that were taken from lawrence was uh two blood samples because they needed to check whether it was blood samples uh, were found on the wall and the floor whether they were george's or lawrence's uh but uh, lawrence didn't have any uh any uh, uh blood stains no cuts um, evidence wise the light was on in the bedroom the curtains were closed and the electric heaters were on as well as the radio um so we don't know why the light was on the bedroom uh maybe that was just his thing maybe when he came in he switched on all the lights um lawrence's coat and gloves were found on the bed um which does kind of raise a question why why would why would he put his gloves and coat on the bed if indeed he did maybe maybe it was um maybe it was george that did it um the gloves were partially spattered with blood and we don't know why at that point maybe maybe he put on his gloves to leave his hat and coat to leave and said right i'm leaving and then the assault happened and then he was like i need to make this look like a burglary so maybe he took off his coat and his gloves we don't know uh the uh, glass decanter um if you're a patron subscriber you can have a look the decanter's still there it, it's it's a big old thing it's about two kilos it weighs weighs a good old weight it's heavy he was smashed over the head three times uh dr donald tier says potentially three times over the head and once over the over the eyebrows uh but it's it didn't smash at all it, it remained intact so you can see that it's quite a sturdy thing um as mentioned in the episode even though lawrence said that the attack took place or at least the initial attack took place by the sideboard in the sit sitting room uh, when they were in the hallway they found um splashes of blood uh five foot six inches uh high just inside the flat's entrance uh and and george was about five for eight so it kind of that kind of fits just right uh obviously there was uh blood marks from the door at a low level to the lounge the living living room so that was where the body was dragged um he it doesn't look like he did anything to the body when the body was on the floor he pretty much just dumped it there fingerprints were left all over the place he didn't make any attempt to clean them up uh george brinham's wallet was found on him containing 27 pounds which is a decent amount of money then but he didn't steal any um locksmith had to look at the locks and confirmed that all the locks worked perfectly and they hadn't been uh, monkeyed with at all so there wasn't uh, a break-in uh there was disorder but it looked like it had been staged uh i think let's um yeah the, the the crime scene photos are baffling when you when you really look at them there's there's like a selection of like 12 crime scene photos and one is like the front of the house and then the shots of the inside of the house and then there's some uh, autopsy photos but the majority you go like when i when i first pulled out the court records and the police file and i started looking at it i thought oh wow there must be there must be someone in these pictures who relates to the murder or this there must be something specific about it because they keep focusing on the, the these homo erotic statues and the gay porn i thought it must be really key to the evidence but it's not like it, the the gay po like the statues weren't used as a murder weapon they were just in the room in the same way that if you look at the photos there's some african statues but they didn't take pictures of the african statues saying oh well maybe maybe uh maybe this is a, a racially motivated thing they didn't do that at all they just focused on the the homosexual statues and the gay porn no evidence that it was even brought out that night it was just they found it in a drawer and they went brilliant some gay porn that's uh that's perfect that will uh sort everything out so um 
interest in this case i went in and i, I pulled out one file and i was uh, there was i was like oh there's so much missing and then i found that there was another file that had been misfiled which I, I managed to pull out and it had the crime scene photos of george lying on the floor which is what i wanted to see because i wanted because there's so much redaction in this file like big chunks of it are redacted and it's something to do with how george was found and it's something to do with i think it's something to do with um the men who were accused of being uh, gay and having sex with George Pryor, I think, but it's heavily redacted and these parts of the file are closed until 2048. So I'll, I won't get to see them for a good, good chunk of years. Um, but when I saw the, when I got the new file out and there was some of the unredacted stuff in there, it was great, but there's still pieces missing. There's still a lot of pieces missing that we don't know, which is why, I have to be slightly cautious around this. I think for me, there's no reference to Lawrence having a medical report, which is why I put in there that they didn't even mention it in the court documents from what I can see, although they are redacted. Um, but you would think if someone claims that they've been assaulted, you would want them to have a medical report. So you can, so you can see if they've got defensive wounds or blood under the nails or anything like that, but they didn't. So uh, it's a real weird one. Um, autopsy, Dr. Donald Tear and his, um, his report. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, it's just fascinating. It's like, it's like I've, used the evidence of dr donald tear quite a few times before and he's a really fascinating guy and if you go back to the uh, joseph mckinstry episode the one where he threw that lady over oh uh, i think it was waterloo bridge and then do you know he he was oh god that tea is horrible i don't know what i've done wrong with it he was the kind of the only one who really said this is an accident this is a murder and this is why and you can really respect where he comes from but he's he's very old-fashioned i think a lot of people use that phrase and uh he's i think as a religious man he, he was very very intolerant and it kind of comes across and you wouldn't really think that someone as highly respected as that home office pathologist would come across to this and go well uh the reason why he died is that his skull was thin and that's because he spent his whole life being a practicing homosexual and a, a self-inflicted pervert it's just utterly baffling it really is so uh um uh, so pretty much most of the evidence is as you'd expect um he's honest about all that but when it comes to his own opinions you just go what the fuck is this man about um uh, he said injuries could have been caused by exhibit three which was the decanter which was heavy and unbroken uh he said there was a combination of injuries caused to death uh, not one by itself but is mostly done by multiple blows possibly three to the head possibly four including one to the front um as mentioned he said the skull was normal thickness only at the back of the skull but not anywhere where i have described the fractures less force would fracture a thin skull of that of a normal man um now looking at this um george seems to have suffered because he, he, he did have a thin skull uh george seemed to have suffered from bipatrial osteodystrophy. it's a long word uh, basically a thinning of the patrial bones um uh just uh, parts of his skull like sides of his skull were fine top of his skull was thinning around it um it just seems to be a, a, something that's genetic but it's also something that like uh, uh um, do you know when you got arthritis over life your bones change as you go through life and as you get older they change his seems to have changes changed as well um so that seems to be it although he seems to claim that it's it's down to him being homosexual um the uh, george's body uh had a rectal exam um even though there was no evidence that there was a sexual assault had taken place they still did that to george but not to lawrence and he said i examined the anus i admitted three fingers and there was a large and and uh, this was larger than normal this would have been caused by homosexuality or self-inflicted perversion it would suggest that either had been practiced over a long period of time so there you go there you go all kind of useful stuff which kind of for the uh for the court basically said this was entirely provocation and we can use this defense 
uh, which is amazing that kind of the uh, the prosecution who were really there to kind of hopefully defend George really didn't step up to this um uh what else have we got what else have we got the body was identified by uh harry who was uh george's brother um it was mentioned in there that harry's son was a serving policeman uh for the met police and the, but they didn't want to use him in the end as a, uh, an evidence even though he identified the body because they were worried how this would uh impact on the officer's uh, career mm. uh coot outside making it making a terrible noise as always the I, I i brushed over this but the um the arrest of the arrest and fleeing of lawrence um that night uh he left that he left the flat he realized he'd left his uh coat and gloves inside he knew he couldn't get back in he could have broken in but then he possibly would have been charged with uh breaking and entering and then leaving more fingerprints there so he made the decision to leave he went to uh, gloucester road tube made it back to victoria where he stayed with his dad and in the morning uh he made his way to finchley where he stole a, a minivan he went past a van it had keys in the ignition and he nicked it um he drove up to his mum's he dumped the van not too far from his mum's and when the van was reported missing um police found it inside with his fingerprints his fingerprints already on file um there you go all linked together didn't need to really explain much about that uh what else we got what else we got uh, i think i might be it i think i might be it yeah i think that's the lot that's pretty much everything i didn't manage to put in so uh yeah yeah let's let's do the the quiz questions and then i can go and get a belgian bun belgian bun oh made with made with um lemon curd Ooh, and yesterday i had uh uh bait some bake or tarts their bake or tarts are really nice they're very jammy very frangipani ever it's got it's got do you know what it's got enough of everything sometimes there's not enough of everything but there's enough of everything and they do really really good uh bread puddings like s real thick slabs bigger than your hand um so let's do the quiz questions um question number one in what year was the sexual offenses act passed which inverted commas decriminalized homosexuality it was 1967 <sighs> 1967 that was um Question number two. What was George's middle name? He was named after an engine. It was Ivor. Question number three. What job did George's dad do? Elijah was a fisherman. Question number four. What was George's first job? He was an apprentice joiner, uh, which is a carpenter. Question number five. What age was George when he became chairman of the Labour Party? 42 mr speaker uh, question number six in what i'm gonna be doing that all day now in what park did george meet the unnamed naval rating it was hyde park question number seven gay panic was defined by a psychiatrist by what title homosexual panic disorder question number eight outside of what kind of shop did george and lawrence meet it was a gunsmith i went searching to try and find because in the records they didn't list which where the shop was they just said it was near the strand and i found one in the 1960s near trafalgar square but i can't confirm it was that one but i think it was uh question number nine what two drinks do we know that they drank uh it was brandy and brown ale and question number 10 what two films did they see at the cinema it was Tarzan and Aladdin. There you go. There's an annoying helicopter flying over again. Utter bastards. Uh, so anyway, that's me done. Whoa. Hope you enjoyed that. Was this how many more episodes have I got to do? Um, oh, great. No. So this is 194. 194, yes. So next week's episode uh, is a two-parter interesting case that i stumbled across ages ago which i'll put out uh and then that will be the uh final official murder mile episodes i'll do a uh, murder mile christmas special and then we'll take a break <sighs> i could do with it i'm I've, i'm beat i am beat i've got nothing left 
oh i can't wait to have a break so thank you to everyone for supporting murder mile it's very much appreciated hope you're all well and uh having good lives and doing what you need to do and not worrying about stuff and just and just saying to yourself you know what fuck it i'm gonna have a cake and enjoy life i'm gonna enjoy my hot chocolate now so um thank you so much everyone have yourself a good week stay safe be good lots of love <laughs>